Uh, they always say you should start out with a joke. And the joke is, if, uh, and it may not be a joke, uh, those of you who are looking for the Stormy Daniels lecture, that's upstairs <laughs> in a very different location. Um, I, um, I started out looking at talking again uh, to, to all of you. Um, some of you were, uh, have been with me on a number of talks. Uh, it's appropriate that we keep discussing the subject of right whales because uh, the story is ever-changing, but unfortunately it's also uh, getting ever sadder. And you may know that a right whale actually passed by Nantucket in the last several days as a dead carcass. Uh, we've lost yet another one. Uh, so as, as I go through this, I hope you will join me in understanding that if we're to save precious animals on, on this earth, we're going to have to deal with them as realistically and as thoroughly as we can. Uh, so the story is not an entirely good one, but it is one that is deeply grounded in, in, in the stories of New England, in the industry of New England, uh, in fact, in, in a lot that is shown here at this magnificent uh, museum. Uh, that is not a, uh, a right whale. I'm talking about a very different creature and one that is in, uh, in really very bad shape. But I think the last thing to know is that it, this is your whale. Uh, if you're a visitor to Nantucket or uh, if, you, uh, if you're a local, uh, right whales live in these waters in the wintertime and into, into the spring. And uh, so this is a story about an animal uh, that is rarer than the ones you see often on Animal Planet. Uh, I've always been amused and have related my times um, at sea. I used to go to sea and I'd rush in and look at Animal Planet and enjoy the, uh, the beautiful videos, uh, not realizing that outside my front door, literally in Provincetown, there were living right whales, rarer than most of the large mammals on Earth. And this is true also of Nantucket. So uh, this is a story about your animal. Uh, and it's not a happy story, but I think at the end I can show you some of the things at the center that we're doing uh, that at least offer some hope for its future. Uh, th this was uh, the first title. The title I gave, I think I talked in November here, very different temperatures, uh, James said. Uh, and, uh, and I changed the title because more and more I'm, I'm wanting to, to, to mention that this is a species which is yours and it is on the very brink of extinction. And all trajectories at present are negative. And those are the things I will talk about and about some of the things we're trying to do for right whales. Uh, what I'd like to do is to talk uh, first about who is the right whale. And, and I think to get into that, uh, maybe... Um, those of you who might have been with me talking here uh, in November could raise your hand so I get a sense of where to direct things. We got one, only one. Uh, so only, well, that's good. So you're going to have to hear the same line, and I'm going. But this guy knows knows his whales, so he knows what he's in for. So first, I'd like to tell you what the right whale looks like, and that's important because you may see them here. Uh, they're notorious for being uh, along the south shore of Nantucket. Uh, we used to get lots of reports from the people working at the airport that they were seeing right whales. I'd like to talk about their present status. That's kind of the, the discouraging part of it, but it is the honest part. Uh, what are their threats? And that is obviously critical for the future of the population. Uh, what are we doing at our laboratory? And those are some of the somewhat hopeful parts of the story. And uh, what will the right whale's future be? Or better still, can the species be saved? And I'm, I won't be able to tell you the answers to some of these, these questions in, in toto because this is a scientific study and this is an extraordinarily rare animal. But its story is being written in our waters and maybe we can at least at the end have some hope that its future will be 
will be available to future generations. Uh, the, the right whales uh, fall into a category of animals, the, the large whales, and, and I like to always point out, it's typical of biology, that they have complex lifestyles and complex morphologies that match their lifestyles, often related to their feeding activities, which seem to be some of the principal things they do in our waters. Uh, the humpbacks uh, were shown in that illustration. These are ones that you would see if you're, if you're going out whale watching, or the fin whales. Uh, uh, I, I, I have to say that um, kids used to ask me how I could imagine whales, and, and I think I've uh, probably a, a few of you have heard this before, but I, used, I, I, I love gardening, so I, I use squash as my as my structures. And so the, the humpback um, is, is, uh, is somewhat the crookneck squash of, of, of whales, a 40-ton crookneck. Um, the fin whale is a long and thin, so that's my zucchini. Uh, and the zucchinis and the, uh, and the uh, crookneck squash are fish feeders. And so uh, we look beyond them, and you can see uh, the humpbacks and the fin whales in there. Uh, we can look at uh, the two whales that are circled, which are belaned whales. And some of you have seen shows, I'm sure, on the bowhead, the upper uh, left of the ones that you're looking at there. That's the one that is killed still in, uh, in the area of the, uh, of, of the uh, Bering Strait and to the north along the north coast of, uh, of North America, northwest coast. Uh, but in the lower right is a is a very is a poor illustration of a hump of a right whale, which I call the sort of the uh, Hubbard squash of whales. Uh, it is very broad uh, and it's an extraordinary creature. But it it like the bowhead is an odd looking creature, and these uh, whales such as this one are indeed uh, very broad. Uh, they may weigh something on the order of 60 tons and uh, at only 45 feet in length. So the fin whales, which grow up to perhaps uh, over 80 feet in length, uh, are, are long and thin and may not weigh as much as these very broad uh, right whales. A few of the, of the characteristics, the callosity on the head of the animal, we'll sp spend time on as we will talking about the baleen, the big filtering mechanism. Uh, that was so valuable to the earliest whalers, uh, called whalebone, sort of a plastic-like material. It's actually like your fingernail. If you feel it, it's a, it, it has a lot of the chemical constituents of, of fingernail. Uh, you see the eye is low on the, on the side of the, of the animal, uh, and uh, there's a flipper, not too obvious in this image, but a, a broad paddle-shaped flipper, not the long, thin one you see in humpbacks. And then a giant flukes, uh, the tail of the animal. And they have huge tails and huge muscle, muscle bands, largely, I think, to drive this, this immense mouth and its, its finely divided baleen through the water uh, so that the animal can feed. And that's, again, something we'll take a look at. Right whales have a V-spout. So again, if you're looking along the shores, uh, particularly the south side of, of uh, Nantucket, Look for the V-spout. If you see a V-spout, you are very likely to be looking at this nearly ex extinct animal. Wait around, because they're notorious, and some of the people here, I'm sure, have seen them come in close to the land. They will come right into the shallow water. In some parts of the world, they will, they will ground out. They actually will be on the bottom. Uh, they have those paddle flippers. We see that in the upper part of that picture and then a very odd-looking face. The big baleen uh, rack is so shown here. The, the, that picture on the left is a dead animal, uh, one of the whales I knew well, a big female uh, who was killed by a ship strike. And when we have a right whale on the beach, uh, it's like dissecting a dinosaur. Little is known about them, and, all, and they're fully dissected to try to at least try to understand them. The baleen in this picture probably weighed on the order of a couple of tons, and it is the huge filtration mechanism that the whales use to feed on, on plankton. 
Right whales are found around the world, but in, in the northern hemisphere in very low numbers. Uh, so if you uh, look up here, you see uh, our northwest uh, Atlantic population. This is the North Atlantic. Here's the coast of, uh, from Florida all the way up uh, into uh, the region around Newfoundland. And that is now the range of the North Atlantic right whale. But it is focused in our waters from pretty much from Nantucket north to, uh, to Nova Scotia is the, is, the, is the place where the last right whales are found. On the other side, in the Pacific, there is a North Pacific right whale, and then circum-Antarctic, this is the Antarctic, is the Southern Hemisphere right whale. And those are believed to be th three different species, the rarest of which is the right whale of the North Atlantic. Uh, here's a, uh, a look at, the, at, at, if you will, the, uh, the area that we're, we're looking at. Um, and uh, you'll see that the Gulf of Maine is somewhat of, a, of an enclosed area. And the area of, uh, whoops, excuse me, I got a new clicker here, so I'm going to have to work with it. Here uh, is the central basin of the Gulf of Maine, and here's Cape Cod Bay, which in the last, uh, actually, eight years has had the greatest concentrations of right whales uh, ever seen in historic times. Uh, and that's what I will be spending most of the rest of my comments on. It used to be that right whales were found here up in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the bay between Maine and, uh, and, and uh, Canada. Uh, off of Nova Scotia, the Bay of Fundy, uh, and that has changed. In fact, so did they used to be found uh, east of Nantucket in great numbers. Well, great numbers. When you're almost extinct, 10 animals is great numbers. Uh, this area, which is known locally as the Great South Channel, that also has now seen a, a drop in the numbers. And meanwhile, in Cape Cod Bay, the numbers have been increasing dramatically. Uh, the right whales, then, that we're studying are, are in, in our little bay, uh, Cape Cod Bay, and stretching on probably as a continuum to the area south of, of Nantucket and, the, and, uh, and Martha's Vineyard. Uh, but mostly in Cape Cod Bay, we're seeing a critical habitat for the feeding of this species. Uh, it looks like 40 to 60 percent of the remaining population comes into Cape Cod Bay each year. Uh, and that sounds terrific, you know, uh, makes me famous and all that stuff. Except you don't want to have an animal that is capable of roaming the entire North Atlantic and, and used to live on along all of the coasts, all jammed in in its last bit of the population into a tiny bay. So I'm, as much as it's great for our study, it's, it's disquieting because we can't lose any more right whales. And I, will, I think I can show you why the loss of individual right whales now is, is a disaster in terms of their future and certainly in terms of biodiversity. Uh, it happens that not only do they come to our waters here, but they are feeding and they're nursing their young. The young are born uh, off the coast of Florida and Georgia, and, uh, and they are brought up into these waters where they feed, they nurse their young, and they socialize. There is a bloody history that's part of this story. Uh, that history... Uh, involved heavy whaling activity. And on, uh, you know, really on the turn of the century, uh, the right whale's numbers, that is the, the, the 20th century, the 1900s, the numbers of right whales had dropped so severely that there really weren't enough left to be hunting. In fact, that drop may have happened uh, even earlier, on into the uh, 1800s. So the numbers which, uh, which, which which resulted in what we have today, began to decline. It appears entirely because of hunting. Uh, for some species of rare animals, you know, there is loss of habitat and there are a whole bunch of other things. But in the case of right whales, it looks like the drop in numbers was because of, of hunting, and there seems little doubt about it. So this is one rendition of 
the story, uh, and it is only one rendition. It, it's it's uh, Reeves et al., and they tried to make an estimate of how many right whales there were. By some accounts now, there may have been 20,000, not 2,000, along this coordinate. And if you look at it, they estimated the numbers of animals that were taken and the drop, the severe drop that happened. And, and according to this, and it is one statistical analysis, the right whale population collapsed in the 1700s, so it was a long time ago. And in the time after that, their estimates are that the population just didn't come back. By some estimates, in this period here, in the 1760s to 1780s, there may have been only eight females left. So it looked like the population was about gone. And I have to say, in the midst of that, there is some hope because we have more than eight females left and they were able to make it back. It's something that, that I hang, hang my hope on. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's well placed. So the numbers appear to come back. These are different statistical estimates. And they came back until in the, in the 1990s, it looked like the situation was going to be OK. Uh, it looked like they were coming back very slowly. Uh, but the bloody history has turned into a dismal present. And it's largely founded on that early whaling. Everything seems to be that. And some of the great work, by the way, that has been done on that early whaling was done here by an ethnographer uh, who showed some of the data that was just not available anywhere else. A woman named Elizabeth Little, who's passed away, but gave me the clues as to the beginnings of our research. So I, I need to mention her in these, in these halls. So we're now looking at what I call a dismal present. The right whale population used to be spread all the way from our coasts in great abundance, uh, was found as far north as Jan Mayen along the Norwegian coast in great numbers here in the Bay of Biscay. And uh, along the Florida and Georgia coast, there were whales giving birth. We'll see a little more of that. And the reflection in those early years was, was a calving ground uh, here in Sintra Bay off the coast of North Africa. So there were two concentrations of whales, which then in the 1100s started to be hunted by, the, by uh, people in the Bay of Biscay, uh, mostly the Basques. And the hunting proceeded as they, as they basically uh, decimated the populations here. They moved out around and eventually came uh, to work along the coast of Labrador and ultimately in places like Cape Cod Bay, uh, Long Island Sound. And unfortunately, they also went down to the coast of Florida and Georgia, but even more so, they, they eliminated or extirpated the, the whales that were calving uh, here in Sintra Bay. So the situation in that early period was that, and now we're left with a, a remnant population in the Gulf of Maine. It's kind of depressing, right? And I'm sorry about that, but it is the story of this animal. So this is what we're left with. Uh, it is a population which moves back and forth along this coast and comes into Cape Cod Bay. Uh, well, that story seemed to be looking pretty good. And, um, and, and a lot of us were encouraged because the population was slowly crawling out of the deep depths that it was in. And it is now a lot better than eight females, if indeed that number is correct. But here are the kinds of, of episodic events that, that rare animals have to deal with. Uh, this is just a small portion. It's actually six individuals. These are all known right whales, and we'll see, we'll see how we know the individuals. These are all known right whales uh, that died in the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, this last year. In fact, uh, 13 or 14 of them died in the Gulf of St. Lawrence of ship strike and entanglement. Uh, 
That, uh, that is represented by these. These, again, are whales, many of whom come to the, to the Cape and the islands in the wintertime to feed. Uh, so, uh, I, and I guess I ought to just mention, the ones that give us great concern are the females, and we'll see why that is in a moment. Uh, and, and, and here's kind of the beginning of that story. Uh, the North Atlantic right whale story is obviously a, a game of arithmetic. And those of us who deal on the edge of, of this extinction are dealing with that arithmetic as best we can. It is calves minus deaths. Uh, it gives us our trajectory. Uh, this is a listing, and I think most of you can see it. It shows the years and the number of calves born. There are very intense pieces of work being done, much like ours in Cape Cod Bay, off the coast of Florida and Georgia, where calving still goes on. And what you see is uh, a lot of fluctuation. And that is usually typical of rare animals. They go up and down in numbers of calves and the like. Uh, the, so the birth rate uh, fluctuates. We had a bad period here in 99 and 2000. And then it looks like in 2017 we look pretty bad. Uh, and here is 2018. We had no calves born to the population. No calves. No population in as low as that can maintain if calving does not go on. If young are not born, that's the end of the species. It's functional extinction. And some of my colleagues have said that at the rate we're going, we're going we're to see functional extinction in about, uh, well, they're estimating 28 years. I'm not sure where they got that. And frankly, what you see is that occasionally there are, sh are, are big spikes. And I'm anticipating a big spike right now, uh, this year. I'm, I'm expecting to, to, to see a big spike, and that means I want to see 30 calves born. And it's quite reasonable because, look, if, uh, if there are, as I will tell you, uh, 108 females, ca uh, females that are of the right age, Look, there were five born in two years. There are a whole bunch of females in that mating system that should be producing calves. Unfortunately, some of the 108 uh, are barren, and we don't know why that is. They have never produced a calf. We'll see a female in a little while who's done very well. She's, done, she's produced a lot, but some of them just are not calving. And... Uh, we're trying to figure that out. So here's the dismal arithmetic, um, and then maybe we can get around this corner of, of unfortunateness. Uh, it looks like there were five calves born. We now pretty much conclude that. There were 17 whales that died last year in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and along the East Coast. Several of them came, came up on, on the islands, actually. Uh, and in 2018... Uh, we have no calves born. We know that there are two dead, but let me clear up this number here. Those are carcasses that have been found. We're in an area of westerly winds, and that means floating carcasses drift far out to sea. And so it is very likely that those are minimums and that there are more whales that have, that have died. That's the bad part of the story, and this is the reflection of it. This is the work of Richard Pace and all, uh, at all. He has done some remarkable work. He's an extraordinary statistician. And what I'm talking about here, by the way, is a, is a, is a worldwide um, conservation issue. When, when a whale is found dead off of, off of uh, Martha's Vineyard, as happened a few days ago, you can be assured that virtually every cetologist and many large mammal specialists across the world know about it. Everybody is watching carefully as to what happens. So this curve fits with the old one that I showed you, the one that was a, a pretty good estimate. But this is more precise. And this shows males and females and the estimated numbers through the years up to 2015. Uh, up to 2015, the estimate was uh, 430 individuals down from a population 
peak probably in here of something on the order of 500. So we've lost a bunch of animals and that's why this trajectory is tending down and it does not include that mass mortality that I showed you earlier. So, because that was 2017, so we had maybe 430 here, total males and females, and the numbers probably dropped. That uh, is, and here may be one of the reasons, by the way. Look at that. These animals should be producing equal numbers of males and females. Look what we got. The estimates show, and it's clear from our data, that the females are dying faster than the males. And I know, I have to admit, that the females are the more important of the genders. Uh, they are the producers. Uh, the males are sort of, well, someone said they're randy. They, they, can, they can fertilize females easily, but the females have to carry the young and whatever. And that difference is one of the great concerns. Uh, it, it, is, it is not now exactly clear what's happening. And out of that, maybe 108 reproductively mature females have to produce the young. Uh, this just says what I just told you, which is the mortality in pink of females is, high, is they're not living beyond something on the order of 55 years of age, uh, whereas the males go on and they're doing fine out close to 90. Uh, and the reflection back on that is the mortality, which shows the same thing. Uh, and I guess this um, further tells you the story. I had promised Carol not to put in graphs, but it's my game is graphs, so maybe this will be the last one. And, and that is showing the southern hemisphere right whales in different populations and the rate of calving is going up dramatically. And here is the North Atlantic right whale calving. It's flat. The population is growing maybe at 1%, maybe at 1.5%, and this last year is dropping. So that just says something's dysfunctional. And that then leads us to the issues, and I'll fly through them and just tell you that these are issues not just for whales. These whales are almost metaphors for, for the treatment of our ocean and the issues interacting. There are issues that are settled. There are ones that we, can, we know, we know wh wh what they're doing, what the problems are, and why they're impacting whales and our marine ecosystem. And then there are the ones that we just don't understand we're trying to. And so we have, for instance, on the left, one that I always recommend people to stay on top of if you're interested in your oceans and in the resources, including the, the, the edible resources, and that is noise. It turns out that while we, including me, were traveling around in boats and worrying about pollution, we forgot that we were blasting noise into an ecosystem that really can't be understood by most animals that have to use it without using sound. So we're we're, we're doing what you don't want to have happen. That is, at, at 7 in the morning, a truck comes outside your house and is, keeps its engine running, and you're trying to make sense of whether, what you're going to have for breakfast. And pretty soon, you're, you're confused and you don't like it, and it likely impacts you in terms of stress and whatever. So noise is an issue. There's minerals exploration. There are wind farms that I know all of you are probably tuned into, um, the, the major efforts to try to fight uh, the, the battle against uh, climate change involves those wind farms, uh, and, and yet they are, they are considered to be issues. Uh, there is oil pollution, contaminants uh, of all different sorts, microplastics. Uh, Laura, my wife, is, a, is, is working on microplastic effects in the ocean, uh, battling straws and plastic bags. Uh, we have toxic algal blooms, uh, which are not well understood, but they certainly are part of the story. But the most dramatic parts of, of the issues with right whales are the mortalities caused by ship strike and entanglement, and those are shown there. 
For me, however, the great issue is the calving rate because that is not a settled issue. We don't understand why the population is not calving. And without it, we're in trouble. So the big issues, entanglement, ship strike, low birth rate, and then, of course, the one that is uh, so impactful across the board, and that is the warming ocean, which is impacting their critical habitat in Cape Cod Bay to the degree that I am certain that our study will begin to see fewer and fewer whales and their future feeding ground may be somewhere else. So the right whales, um, they grew up in an ocean, when you think about it, over millennia. They came to these shores, different shores. They grew up in an ocean that was boundless. They did not have a boundary but the edges of continents and islands. Uh, they now are dealing with an ocean that is encircled by nets and fisheries and whatever. Essential to us, but a problem for them. They grew up in an ocean uh, that had probably a boundless food supply. That food supply has changed. It's a changed ecosystem. It was a system which they grew up in as did our ancestors, that was relatively changeless over long periods of time. And habits could develop and morphologies could develop, huge mouths that could feed on plankton. They grew up in an ocean that was silent, except for the sounds of animals, wind and waves, and they could communicate. That ocean is now noisy. Just stick your head in the ocean and you won't find many silent places. And so uh, the, the, this is a, something I think I've given to some of you before, but I give it to you again um, because it is a great line, but mostly I want to know, I want somebody to tell me where this came from because I can't credit it. We are not the beasts of legend these are not the beast of legend that frightened and gave us epic stories of men contesting sovereignty with the sea of the sea with them. They are now to be seen as our charges. We are stewards of them and masters of their future. What an interesting change it has been. Look around you in this magnificent place. These animals that were, that we that were hunted were terrifying creatures, and now. Even these, the sperm whales, have got to be thought of as, as in trouble in an ocean which no longer does what it once did for them. So uh, now to, to, to the question of solutions. And I'm going to say that solutions depend on knowing what's wrong. And therein lies what we all do. Those of us who are trying to figure out how to solve problems have to figure out what the problem is before we can get to the solutions. And a lot of the work that is being done has hope in it and also uh, is identifying what's going on. It's not a simple problem. Uh, our work at the, at, the, at the Center for Coastal Studies, which will give me a chance to show you lots of pictures of right whales, uh, has three different parts distribution work, food work, and, uh, and we do disentanglement work. And the disentanglement work uh, has associated with it some pretty dramatic uh, uh, footage, so I'll, I'll give you a chance to get a little excited. Our, our work uh, involves two different uh, teams. I just, I just collect the data from them. They're the people who do the work. A, a vessel team on the right and an aircraft team that flies over whales and gets many of the pictures that you'll see. We ask from that uh, air team, uh, we do surveillance and we warn ships of the presence of whales and we get distribution information. The question is, who are the individual whales? Well, how is it? Could you know one whale from the other? Uh, if you've seen humpbacks, you can know them by their tails, but right whales don't have marked tails, so how would we know them? Where are the whales? Uh, what injuries do they have? And we keep track of that with some detail. And then, and then we like to know what long-term changes there are. How are they changing what they're doing? Um, so I have this, this really remarkable team of specialists that will shortly be joining me for the next field season. 
Uh, they fly in small aircraft. Uh, they don't let me in the aircraft. I'm, I try to get in, but they won't let me aboard because I haven't been properly trained. So uh, I just stand on the ground, and I'm thankful because I don't like little airplanes. And they fly at 100 knots, uh, 1,000 feet off of, a, off of a sea that is almost lethal in the midwinter. Uh, they're an extraordinary team of people, and uh, they, they are due all the credit we can give them. They looked down on Wales to try to get a picture of this. It's a roughened pattern. This is, they're looking at the face of a right whale. And I put a box around uh, this part of it because here's what that looks like when there are not organisms attached to it. So this is a whole little ecosystem on the head of a right whale. Uh, and this may be a 35, 40 foot long animal. It is, the roughened skin patches are black skin. They're infested by organisms closely related to the beach hoppers that you see if you kick seaweed over uh, when you're walking along a beach. They don't look like it. They look like lice. And the old whalers called them lice because they looked like them. They're just, it's parallel adaptation. They have, uh, they have grown uh, to cling to the roughened skin patches and they grow in colonies on those skin patches. Each skin patch is individually distinctive and that's how we know the individuals. So the skin patches have this light colored uh, material on them. They're called cyamids, the individual animals. They're about that big and they grow as a carpet on the heads of these animals. And lucky they do, because our air team flies over them, takes pictures of them, and they, they are highlighted by, that is the callosity, the individually distinctive callosity pattern is highlighted by these carpets of, of, of tiny organisms that live only on the heads of right whales. And so we take pictures. Uh, here are some that have been intensified. And you can see this whale's, the, the white blotches are the, on the upper jaw of the animal. And you can see how different they are. Two different whales uh, with very different patterns. It doesn't take too much to know one from another if you see that. My people know about 750 animals. Many of them have died. Uh, so they got brains that are a little different than mine. I can't remember one. If you give me 40 whales, I can't tell one from another. But they can. Uh, and they make these drawings. And, uh, and out of that come stories like this. This is a, a whale we'll see a little more of in a moment. This is an individual. And these are the individual's calves, the first row around here. These are all calves that have been born to this right whale. Uh, this is, this is the right whale is known as wart because of that little black spot in the middle of its callosity. Wart does not know what we call her. Uh, so uh, uh, it's an embarrassing name. She's probably embarrassed if she's heard us yell something at her. But, but she has done pretty well nonetheless. She's produced all these calves. And out of those calves have come, co have come her grand calves. They're around here. And here are her great grand calves over here. And insignia gave birth. These are all names that, that we give to these animals, the people in our field. And you can see that she has, she has produced them. But how do we know all that? We know that because of these callosities that you see here. Those are the, those are the if you will, are the faces of the animals. Uh, they're, they give us a deep insight into who's who and who's doing what. And that kind of approach allows us to know something about the society of these animals. And so we see lots of uh, callosities. These are all images. All of the aerial shots are ones that were taken uh, just a few months ago. And you can see that they're individually distinctive. This whale, by the way, I asked for, for callosity photos from my, my people when I came to come here. And Lo and behold, they gave me one that had an entanglement. There's an entanglement in the baleen, and one of the most difficult ones because it's, in, it's way up on the head of the animal and preventing him probably from doing a good job feeding, although right now its mouth is open. There's the wall of baleen, the lower jaw is dropped, so the whale's still feeding in spite of that problem. Uh, this is just, look, they have to identify a whale just from that sort of 
view in all the froth of, of a whale, uh, a whale in a social group. Uh, so these are the views of individuals, and I and I hope I've convinced you you can know the whales. And if you take a good picture off the south shore of Nantucket with a telephoto, we'll know who that whale is, and we'll know its history, we'll know its gender, we'll know probably its kids, if you will. So uh, those are our 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 views. We end up matching those photos to catalogs and working with our colleagues. We have a very tight relationship with everyone who's working on right whales. Uh, we have great uh, volumes of photos. We can know who the whales are. Uh, that, is, that knowing who whales are gets projected into many different things that I won't spend my time on today, but that is one very important part of what the center is doing. Another part is the disentanglement work, and that we get a lot of press. Uh, you probably hear me talking about it a lot. Uh, so I wanted to show some of that, and uh, there's only one person here who's probably seen these images, the, the video before, so he'll just have to, have to watch it again. Uh, our disentang these are uh, views that you'll see, uh, both stills and video uh, from disentanglements that I was involved with. Uh, our disentanglement team now at, at the Center for Coastal Studies is working 24-7, uh, 365. They, are, they, they work even in the middle of the night, yes. Uh, and uh, they're tra they train teams nationally. And up until this last year, we had a remarkable safety record. Uh, however, unfortunately, uh, a dedicated fisherman who we had trained uh, working to try to free one of those one of the whales that was found in that area of mortality uh, in Canada, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, um, uh, was struck by a right whale that he was disentangling and killed instantly. So it is not a safe undertaking, uh, and uh, and his name is Joe ha Joe Howlett and. Uh, he didn't suffer, at least, but the whale did strike him. And so this is not an easy task, but he was a very dedicated individual. And the whale that he was working on, uh, he had freed. And the last thrust of the, of the tail as the whale swam away was what, uh, was what killed him. Uh, we train teams then, and we try to train them so we don't have those terrible problems. And... Uh, and we're still trying to figure that out. And we have a, an active international program at the center, and it has trained teams of people in 23 countries now. Uh, my colleague who developed disentanglement work with me, uh, Dave Matilla, uh, we did the early work on developing the methods. He now is traveling the world to try to tell people in other countries uh, how they can free whales from, from entanglement. So it's a really... It's an exciting part of the story, and we do collect essential data on, on entanglement to try to reduce the, the occurrence of it. Uh, that's, a, that's a look. You'll often see me in these pictures uh, wearing a, a, a lacrosse helmet, uh, so you'll know me in those pictures. Uh, this is a whale that we failed to disentangle. Right whales are extraordinarily difficult animals. They are so powerful and have such big tails they're, they're an animal you don't want to get near. Uh, and so, and the, and the helmets, by the way, are not, uh, although we say it differently, the reality is if you get struck by a tail, the helmet doesn't help you. Um, it's really actually to keep, when, when you attach gear to an animal under great stress, it's to keep the gear, if it breaks, from coming back and hitting you in the face, uh, at least in my case, and it saved me a couple of times. So um, this whale uh, actually is shown here. Um, we made four attempts to free it. It eventually died probably of starvation uh, east of New Jersey. We had satellite tracking on it, and we could not. We went back to it four, three times and, and couldn't free it. But this does show you, uh, I think, the, 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 the horror of it. Here, June 9th of 2001 and June 26th, and you can see that the that the cyamids, which normally are on the on the callosities, have gone out onto the body and they're sort of eating skin and whatever. So the whale is in terrible shape, and it, and 
Michael Moore at Woods Hole says, and I think properly so, if, we, if you saw any animal of any kind going through months and months of dragging gear and sawing into itself with ropes, you would, you would call it one of the horrors of, of wildlife biology, and yet silently that's what right whales go through when they entangle. Luckily, they don't, not that many entangle, but our effort is to try to, uh, to free the animals. So we have um, looks at, at, at whales um, that, are, that are in the process of being disentangled. This is 2212. For each of these individuals, one of the problems about me talking to you all is that I spend a lot of my life with these individuals, and you get to know them. I try not to think of them as my pet dogs or anything, but it's hard not to know. And if you've known an animal and it has its own habits and they all have their own ways of eating and whatever, and then you see one caught, you want to tell the story. I want to tell you the story of 2212, but I won't. Uh, because it's a long story and one that was somewhat successful. Uh, this is a look um, at, at other individuals' dramatic views. Here's a, here's a look at us working on an individual whose video I'll show you in a moment uh, uh, off of Jacksonville in Florida. Dramatic shots. This is not that whale, but this is another one just off of Nantucket, northeast of Nantucket, and it just shows you uh, what... Uh, how dramatic and powerful these animals can be. That's a huge tail that weighs as much as a, as a Volkswagen. And it almost got us, but it didn't do it, I'm happy to say. It's obvious I wasn't gotten. This is a very much, uh, this, these are all recorded from my helmet cam. Uh, actually, the last one wasn't. That was recorded by the Coast Guard. This is from my helmet cam, and it gives you a look at a much more gentle time this, uh, both that whale and this whale uh, were successfully disentangled. Um, here's the first cut that I'm making, uh, a very sharp blade, trying to get the, the animal's mouth is all torn up by the ropes. Uh, we succeeded in getting, here, here's picking up, trying to get the rope, now that it's been cut, out of the mouth. There it goes. And that whale is now uh, healthy. It is a... Uh, it's, I think, now a 12-year-old male, and, uh, and the baleen has gone back, and it's, so it's, it's doing well. Uh, and this is the last one. This is the most dramatic, um, because in this case, this, that's, uh, that's a look at, at the ropes over a whale uh, uh, that we call kingfisher. I name, wha named whales after the Coast Guard cutters that brought us to the animals, because the Coast Guard did a lot of extraordinary things for us. And uh, here's a look uh, th through my, uh, this is really what I'm seeing because it's, it's uh, my, my helmet cam. And this is the effort to cut free kingfisher. We succeeded with this whale. Uh, this was a success. Um, kingfisher still has a few ropes around its flipper, but they're apparently not giving it any problems. It's, uh, it was, I guess, eight, ten years ago, and it's, the animal's doing very well, and I think is a female. Uh, and this is, again, helmet cam footage. The whale is right against the boat. You can see the boat there, and I'm trying to hold the... Well, you try to hold a 40-ton animal, you're not likely to get anywhere. Uh, and you can see the, the ropes around the flipper, and if you could hear the audio, they're cutting, they're cutting, and they've cut most of the ropes around the body and, uh, and around the flipper, and the whale is not happy. Luckily, this was in Gulf Stream water. So a pretty dramatic uh, scene. And, uh, and one last shot, I think, uh, that the whale takes and, and is then f comparatively free. We then cut all of our own buoys off it. And uh, the whale is, is, is doing well, in fact. Uh, is a common visitor to Cape, the Cape and the islands in the winters. We didn't see it last winter, but we see it most winters, again, knowing the, uh, the, the callosity patterns. And here is the, here's the other part of the success of the disentanglement work, and that is uh, this whale we called wart uh, that you'll remember a moment ago. 
Uh, in 2008, Ward had a line in its mouth that often is, is going to be lethal. Um, in 2009, it looked bad. You can see in 2010, the, somehow or other, got a, the rope over the rostrum, and that killed uh, the, the whale that died off of, off of uh, New Jersey. So it's that wrap across the rostrum. When it tightens down, it cuts into the flesh, and the animal can't feed. Um, 2010, though, you see that happening in April. And then in May of 2010, the disentanglement team succeeded in removing all gear. That's not just good because that whale's OK. It, it goes beyond that into this. This is wart again. And so it shows that you get a lot of bang for your buck, if you will, if you can free an animal. There she is in the middle, and she's still a productive female, unlike some of them. And she has produced over that time quite a few uh, young whales. There is, however, if you look at all the numbers, you will notice that during the period, uh, that 2010 to 2008 period, she wasn't doing well. She did produce a calf in 2013, but when an animal is entangled, it takes a while to recover from all of the damage that has been done. Wart is living, and Wart is a productive female, and so she is one of the hopes of the future. Uh, as, incidentally, is Insignia, who apparently is a, is a young and very productive female. Also, she's, uh, she has produced two calves as, of, as of, uh, of 2017, so pretty good stuff. Um, the last thing I'd like to do, uh, because we're running late, is to just give you looks at a few pictures of, of feeding whales and to say that the most important part of my work is to try to understand and then to try to solve the problem of why calving is not occurring. And I'm doing it in one direction only, and that is looking at the feeding activity on the assumption that food intake or pollutants coming in from food may be the issue. Uh, so we have, these are viewed, that's a remarkable view of a bunch of marauding right whales. Everybody says, oh, whales like right whales are so gentle. Those right whales right there are killing so many copepods, you can't imagine it. But so do clams, too, so, and we always think of them as, as gentle creatures. Uh, but those are mouths of whales with their mouths open and the white tongue in the floor of the mouth, and they're just pushing this net through the water. Uh, the work we do is basic marine biology, looking at the food organisms, uh, here's a right whale feeding along an extraordinary concentration of plankton. You can actually see the tiny organisms, less than a millimeter long, forming a curtain as a right whale feeds along uh, that area. So they're feeding with their mouths wide open. And I think what the last graph I have to show you is this one, which is curious, and I'll tell you what it says. It says that there is a hint that when the food is good in Cape Cod Bay, two years later, the calves are born. Uh, we're, we're still looking at the data, but how interesting that would be. Is that saying, as it may be, that food limitations are causing the problem with calving? There's another part of the story is then what would you do about it? And we'd have to talk about that offline, but, but that is, of course, an issue for all the ecosystems, since the whole ecosystem depends on plankton. Uh, and I guess I should just, well, I won't, I'll just tell you what this says. And we put together a bunch of models which suggest why it is that, uh, that feeding would affect uh, right whales. And basically it says that, that uh, if you're healthy, if an, a mammal is healthy, it succeeds in in producing young. The young have to be, you have to have fertilization, you have to carry the young. These are typical mammals. You have to nurse the young. The young have to be healthy enough to make it. So is it possible that these animals are not receiving the amount of food they should? And the connection uh, that I have to say uh, that I make is that Cape Cod Bay is now the hottest spot in the North Atlantic Ocean maybe has ever been for right whale concentrations. 
They seem to be coming there for food. But it means they're not going to where they used to go. So it's good for Cape Cod Bay, but maybe the offshore places where they used to go are no longer productive. So there are lots of hints that come across uh, that void. Um, I guess uh, I just want to highlight that there were no calves born uh, five last year. Uh, that's 1% and 0% of the population. And our work is with the ecosystem, uh, and we cannot protect them if we don't know where they are. So the last bit of, of, of this story uh, before I close is to say that right whales are not where they used to be. And here's part of that story that has an interesting reflection. It used to be that right whales lived in these areas, and then last year, the right whales moved up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence because there was food there. So it turns out that the moving story of our ecosystem, which apparently is changing dramatically because of, of changes in currents due to changes in temperature, uh, is brought the food from areas here where they used to be. This is, this is Nova Scotia, around Nova Scotia, into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, where there was no good protection for right whales because nobody expected them there. We humans put boxes around areas where, where we want to protect animals. They don't live in boxes. And so they move into places where they have to make a living. And if that place is one that is just not being managed, uh, we haven't put a box around it. We run into a problem which are all these mortalities that happened in, the, in that area. Our work is now spreading into where we think we can predict where the whales are so we can get ahead of them and manage them uh, using the density of food in, in bright colors. Can the right whale of the North Atlantic be saved? I think it is likely going to be. I think over the short term. I think we've seen a bad period. Managers and conservationists are roaring over the story and even fishermen are understanding it. So I believe that the answers are, going to, are lying around the corner. The answer to disentanglement is not disentangle, the answer to entanglement is not disentangling whales. It is stopping them from getting entangled. And there's a big effort, as you may know, to have new methods for stringing, to go ropeless, basically. And I think that offers potential. And staying ahead of where they are and putting management boxes as best we can sensibly, I think, hopes, gives us hope for the future. But stay tuned, because the, the story on, on right whales is not a good one, and I think I've convinced you of that. Hopefully, I haven't depressed you too much. I hope you see that as, as a call to arms. Uh, I wanted to close by mentioning the governing misconceptions that govern all of our use of the oceans. One of them is that there's a primacy in today's knowledge of the oceans or of the, of the world that we live in. And that problem is what I call the arrogance of the intellectual present. That is that today we think we are it. We're cool. We know what there is to know and we know what to do about it. And you know that the next generation will look back at us and say, well, they tried hard, but they didn't exactly get it right. And that's true of our species and maybe of all species, that we're, we believe that what we have today is, is, is what is really is the knowledge that covers all. Uh, the ocean is limitless. If you stand on the shore like my grandfather would say, my God, it goes on forever. What are they worried about pollution for? Well, that's an error in scale. That's trusting your senses. I trust, I mean, I'm part of this problem, believe me. And I trust my senses, and when I get to see, I think it, it doesn't ever stop. But it is, it is limited. Uh, there's a thought that today's uncertainties are trivial. The uncertainties of today uh, are not uh, trivial. The uncertainties are the places where our future lies. And I guess last of all, and maybe my pet peeve, is scientific results are mutable and fungible. Well, 
scientists are human, and they make a lot of dummy, dummy mistakes, and I make mine. But ultimately, science is the place where we're going to get the answers. It's a profound misunderstanding of what science is to think that it, that it is a mutable part of our lives. Uh, Einstein, no less than Einstein, said, said uh, that if we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't call it research. And that really is what science is. So you've been very uh, uh, tolerant to listen to my, my preaching. I'm going to stick on a, a videotape as, as you leave or ask questions or whatever. I'll stick around to, to answer whatever questions, either from the audience or if you want, you can come up and talk to me. Uh, and I'm going to uh, stick on a, uh, a video that I, I, I often show of right whales in Cape Cod Bay. So these are actually feeding happy whales, uh, many of whom are, are doing very well now. And uh, I'll leave you with that and, um, and ask anyone who has an interest in, in talking to me or asking questions. Uh, I hope that there's not too much depression in the, in, the, in the group. And also, Carol is holding up something saying, there is, this situation is so critical that we have started what we call the right whale initiative, emergency initiative, because it is an emergency. And she has cards there and whatever. And it is part of an effort to increase the expansion of our aerial surveys to try to, try to see as many entangled whales as we can and also understand them. So she will probably have those. Uh, available. Carol's over there. She'll hold it up again. Anybody who has an interest in picking one of them up, please do. Uh, and that's what I have for you. Thank you for, uh, for listening to me tonight. <laughs>